Hey friends, uh, thank you so much for joining us again for our weekly Wednesday Bible study during this uh, coronavirus time where we are trying to practice social distancing, even though right now in this room we're a little close together. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but friends, thank you again for joining us. My name is uh, Reverend Caleb Holder. To my left is Reverend Leslie Pepper. And to my right is Dickie Miller. I tell you our names and reiterate that because last week we had a thousand views on these vid videos that we're making. And we want to make sure that if y'all are liking and sharing these things and we're spreading across the social networking system, that y'all know us and get to know us and are able to uh, get a little bit personal as we dive into scripture, as we get to know God more, and as we study together uh, the scriptures, which is vital right now during this time. Today, we are going to be looking at the book of Matthew, and I thought some of the important, uh, some of the important scriptures that we're going to look at today involve how our faith is being tested and how there are waters in our lives that uh, that can overtake us, that can make us doubt, that can make us uh, think uh, things that aren't true, and how we can overcome them by simply grabbing the hand of Jesus and by simply leaning on Jesus during those times where we feel like we are drowning in those waters. So today we're going to start off with Matthew 8, 23 through 27. But before we dive into that scripture, uh, would one of y'all like to pray for us? Would you let me pray this time? Yeah. Pray for us, Dickie. Absolutely. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we come today as always uh, when we approach your throne with thankful hearts for the ability to come to you uh, uh, in the good times uh, and also in the tough times. Uh, uh, in, in either case, we know that your grace is enough uh, for what we need. And today, that's what we're asking for. We ask for the words uh, that you uh, would want us to, to put on the hearts of the people that are listening. We ask you for uh, the peace to know that, uh, that you're driving this bus and that you have control. Uh, please be with us over the next few minutes and as we uh, try to uh, discern your word. And also be with us uh, in the next few days until we have the opportunity to come together. Uh, may God's grace bless all of us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to start today, like I said, with Matthew 8, 23 through 27. And I'm going to ask Reverend Wesley to read that scripture for us. And for some of you that may have seen in the prayer that I gave somebody the thumbs up, if you needed a thumbs up today, that was for you. <laughs> Uh, but if you didn't need a thumbs up for today, Nita Brassfield, our office manager, was shutting the door to the conference room uh, <laughs> so that we would have a, a good quiet space to do that. So apologize for my thumbs up. All right, Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 through 27. It says, And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. A windstorm arose on the sea, so great that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. And they went and woke him up, saying, Lord, save us. We are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, you of little faith? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a dead calm. They were amazed, saying, What sort of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? Wow, a lot to unpack here. But I think one of the important things that we start off with in the book of Matthew is, who is Matthew? And why, why, why is this story important for Matthew to write down? Well, first and foremost, uh, this entire gospel is written almost like an autobiography. It asserts God's world over that of Rome's world. Because at this time, there's a lot of conflict going on between the Jewish community and the Roman community. And because we are trying to really get to the root of who is this Jesus and how is his dominance even over something that Rome can't do, which is control nature itself. He is Jewish. He is a tax collector, according to 
uh, scripture and what we know about Matthew. So all of this is vital. All of this is important. And because he is Jewish, he knows that the significance of water in Jewish history, in the Jewish community, what that is, um, it is in the Hebrew, I believe, called the, am I saying this right, Wesley, Tiamat, which means the sea, something that only God is supposed to have control over. Now, with that in mind, do we have trouble giving God control in our own lives? And I think that's a question that we can spread around here. Yeah, I think our own lives can be as turbulent as the sea. I mean, when you see the disciples in this passage, uh, they are they are clearly panicking. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, they are afraid that this storm is about to destroy them, that yes. they are about to die in this storm. And, uh, you know, uh, sometimes we find ourselves in the middle of physical storms uh, where we th we think we might physically lose our life, but sometimes we find ourselves in the middle of mental storms or spiritual storms where we think we may lose ourselves. And uh, and so we, we, we really see that, I think, in this story uh, in a physical sense, uh, but also when we understand Jesus' connection to these disciples, uh, that there is a, a spiritual awakening that's going on during this three-year time period where Jesus continues to speak spiritual peace into their lives, which finally finds its crescendo at the resurrection of Jesus and then uh, the, the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit falls. Uh, so, yeah, absolutely. Well, I was uh, sitting here thinking about uh, the water uh, aspect of this, and for, for someone that has been in a situation uh, on the water where I was truly concerned for my safety, uh, once upon a time in a job that I had working on an offshore drilling rig, uh, the fear that a person has when they're on the water and they think they're fixing to go in is a very real fear. Uh, also, life can give you that same kind of fear uh, when, when things are so uncertain, when you don't know what to expect next. And, and God promises us, he, as he showed, he has control of the water. Uh, and if he can do that, then he certainly can control the other things that uh, come our way, the other fears that we have. Absolutely. I think one of the hardest issues for us to face as uh, people, as humans, is this idea of relinquishing control. Because so many times we like to have our hands in the topic, we like to have our hands in the subject, we like to... Uh, feel like we have some sort of input or, uh, I guess, relevance and, and this idea that we relinquish these things and allow God to be in control and putting faith over, uh, faith over our own uh, wants, our own desires is really important, uh, especially, you know, during an a epidemic where there's a lot of fear being spread, but uh, how we relinquish control to God is going to be really important for us moving forward. You know, Caleb, there is an old bluegrass song, and I can't remember all of the words to it, but part of it says, he has calmed the troubled waters of my soul. Yes, He's take, taken my life and he's made it whole. There you and, go. Uh, and so uh, we see that uh, Jesus's power in this passage knows no limits, even the sea and the wind respond mm -hmm. to him. Right, very, very right. Um, the second point I kind of wanted to make as far as this passage goes is that these disciples on this boat were very familiar with fishing. In fact, four of the disciples that Jesus called, um, Andrew, Peter, James, John, all fishermen, all had experience on the boat. Now, a storm could strike up on the Sea of Galilee at any moment. Um, I mean, and the waves, I believe, historically, I mean, and people, when you look at it, they could reach 20 feet tall. It was a very deep sea, even though it may not have been width or length long, but it was a very deep sea, and it very uh, well could get bad 
on the Sea of Galilee. And sometimes there could be like 300 boats on the sea at a time. So not only are you worried about the sea pushing you around, you're worried about your boat knocking into another boat possibly on the Sea of Galilee. And so during a storm, usually the sails were taken down so that they wouldn't tear. And these boats were pretty decent size, enough to definitely fit 12, 13 people. And so even with all this experience, the knowledge of the Sea of Galilee, um, and even with seeing Jesus doing prior miracles to what's happening to them on the Sea of Galilee, they panic. There's fear in their hearts. There's this worry. There's this, um, there's this doubt that is so concerning for these disciples. Are they going to perish in the Sea of Galilee? And so my question now is do we continue to doubt even after seeing Christ's power in our own lives? Um, and I think I'm going to open that question up to you guys. Well, I know me personally, I, that's kind of been my track record. Uh, when you get in trouble and you turn to God and you need his help and he comes to your rescue, for a little while you're very thankful that God uh, uh, is in your life and has done what he's done for you. Uh, and then all, all too often we, we tend to forget about him. I, I know in my own case there was a period in my life not too long ago when I wasn't reading God's Word every day. And uh, a good friend of mine recommended that I start doing that. And, and when I did, that's when it changed. So when things get uh, a little tough and a little scary now, I just uh, open up Matthew and find one of these stories here where someone was in a lot worse trouble than I seem to be in and God came to the rescue. So uh, that's what that's what hangs with me on this story is, is uh, that's, that's what God can do for you. Yes. Well, you know, the... Um... Caleb, you're talking about these four, particularly these four disciples who have much experience in boats, uh, very used to turbulent waters, very used to the uh, way that the weather can change so quickly on the Sea of Galilee because of its location really between two sets of hills. So it just kind of channels the weather uh, right through the center of it. Uh, but I think what this reminds me is that none of us, no matter our skill set, our experience, how well prepared we think we are, how self-sufficient we think we are, uh, mm -hmm. that none of us are enough, mm -hmm. that all of us need what Jesus brings to our lives, uh, that Jesus is really the key which completes our lives because he teaches us uh, how we treat others, how we live in the world. Uh, how we weather storms, how we go through difficult times. And, you know, when you see these disciples, and particularly the four that, that we're talking about right now, uh, in spite of their experience with the water, uh, they needed they needed Jesus' help. Mm. It must have been scary on that boat that day for, oh, for experienced fishermen to be <laughs> concerned enough that they thought they were fixing to go into the water. Absolutely. Wow. I would assume they, they didn't wake Jesus uh, up uh, lightly. Uh, so, well, You know, the, um, generally, ancients did not go out into the middle of water bodies. Now, of course, the Sea of Galilee is just a big lake. It's a very big lake, mm -hmm. but it is just a lake. But as far as the sea is concerned, uh, and the salt water, uh, they would fish around close to the shore, uh, inside of the shore because there was this fear of what could happen in the waters if they would go out too far. Mm -hmm. uh, that it was it was a place of, and maybe getting ahead of our discussion. Oh, no, you're good. Uh, uh, but it was a place where danger was held. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in fact, it was sort of understood that sort of evil came from the depths of the water. Uh, hence the reason... In referencing a statement Caleb mentioned a minute ago, it's either in Revelation 5 or Revelation 4. If you're watching this video, read both of them. They're both really wonderful. Throne room uh, visions of John, uh, throne room of heaven visions of John, where the sea is talking about, it's described as being uh, still as glass, calm as glass, and sort of the overarching implication that God has full and complete and total power over the sea. Uh, and so you, you would have, you would have had, uh, 
people who were familiar with the sea, but yet still had a healthy respect for the water. Yes. And, and, it, and its dangerous nature. And I think that kind of, I'm just going to go ahead, that kind of segues, uh, it's always fun to have a great segue, right into the third point of uh, the sea being this very uh, uh, physical but yet spiritual thing in the lives for these disciples. And it, the fact that Jesus could control, because the disciples at this point had not yet recognized Jesus as God's agent, as God's son, having that power that God has that is very cosmic, that is seen in the Old Testament, the power given to Moses, the power that uh, wiped the earth in Noah's Ark and just ridded the world of sin. Um, you are now, we are, the disciples are recognizing this cosmic power that Jesus had over the water, and it usurps essentially the Roman power that is being instilled in the area. And so um, I think that's important to understand that no matter what struggle we are going through, God's power is far greater right. than the power of us, the power of humanity, the, the power of humankind, that God's power is greater and is the power that we should lean on mm -hmm. and depend on. So the question I have right here after point three is, do we put our faith in human power or God's power? And I think that's especially relevant in today's time because a lot of us are leaning on our humanness, this desire to self-preserve, this desire to listen to all these uh, different media outlets dictating what that, uh, dictate, allowing them to dictate our faith. And I think what we really need to allow to dictate our faith is God. Mm -hmm. And so that's a question I'll pose to both of y'all and kind of go into this. Do we put our faith in human power or do we put our faith in God's power? Well, you know, in practice, I, I, I think we probably like to put our faith in human power. In theory, I think we would say that we like to put our faith in God's power. Mm -hmm. It almost reminds me of the statement, I, when you were saying all that, Caleb, I was thinking about the Disney movie, Aladdin. Mm -hmm. And if you remember in that movie, when Genie uh, gets his freedom, uh, he begins to describe his powers as semi-phenomenal, nearly cosmic powers. <laughs> Uh, when we when we see the when we see the story of Jesus in Matthew eight, well, who, we see a Jesus who does not have semi nearly phenomenal phenomenal cosmic powers. Uh, really, as you said, we see a Jesus who uh, commands the cosmos, mm -hmm. who has has who has literally, as the Apostle Paul says in his writings, who has literally been given all power and authority by God. Mm -hmm. uh, to do whatever uh, he chooses to do. And so I think maybe part of the struggle of the Christian li life and probably part of the goal of the Christian life is us learning and growing and maturing to a place where we learn to trust God with more and more and more of our daily walk, of our daily life. Uh, you know, I think in this time where all the these commentators are saying all these different things, and, and some of them are really good, some of them are informed by medical professionals, some of them are just pure politics, uh, but the church's response in the midst of, of all these times is always to be one of faith, is always to be one who seeks to trust God, who seeks to depend on God, uh, but that's a struggle mm -hmm. because our, our human flesh uh doesn't like to deal in faith. It likes to deal in what we can see, what we can touch, Absolutely. Uh, what we can hear. Uh, but this, this scripture assures me that Jesus is the kind of Messiah, he's the kind of Savior uh, that I can trust because he is fully linked in to the power of God the Father, yes. filled with, with the strength of, of God the Spirit. Yes. Um, and that uh, and that gives me confidence. That gives me great confidence. Absolutely. Well, as I sat here and read this uh, yesterday, once Caleb told me what we were going to be talking about, I, I I sat and thought about my my own situation. And if I had been sitting in that boat that day uh, in fear of my life, and someone stood up and calmed the waters, uh, what a 
eye-opening experience that would be. Uh, as, as I have learned, these men were, this was a learning process for them as they learned to trust God and what he was all about and, and the, the, the thought that this person could control the waves and the wind mm -hmm. uh, certainly gave these guys something to, to uh, question and something to look, you know, some, somewhere else to look for something else. Mm -hmm. he, maybe this man is the son of God. So um, that, that was what I took from this, what, what that must have felt like when they realized that. Absolutely. Re I think it's a process for a lot of us, recognizing God as having this amazing cosmic authority over us and really relinquishing our power and understanding how God works through us and how we are able to spread the Spirit to so many people when we just acknowledge the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord of our lives and when we recognize the fact that Jesus Christ does have the power. In fact, it reminds me of the song, I got the power. Um, that, Jesus has it. Jesus has the power. He really, really does. Um, so right here in Matthew, we see the, the um, disciples kind of, oh, he's an agent of God. We're kind of getting into that. Now, in our next scripture that we are about to read, Matthew 14, 22 through 33, the disciples know that Jesus is God's agent. So we're going to flip over to Matthew 14, 22 through 33. Uh, Dickie, would you uh, I will. read that for us? Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly after dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me, to come to, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. All right. I think the beginning of the scripture is really interesting because, once again, Jesus doesn't mind spending some time in solitude. And I think a lot of us, as extroverts, if you're a people person, we're kind of scared of this idea of being quarantined, of being alone in our homes, of, of, uh, of not being able to reach out to one another. But just because we may feel like that doesn't mean we're necessarily alone in our homes spiritually because God is still very much present and he still very much wants a very personal connection with you. Um, and that may look like you being alone in your home for a couple of weeks, praying, reaching out to God, seeing how uh, Jesus in this passage, before he does yet another amazing miracle, an amazing feat, starts out in solitude with his Heavenly Father. I think that's important. What do you guys think about this idea of being in solitude and reaching out to God? Well, you know, Caleb, uh Numerous times during Jesus' ministry, we see him withdraw to pray and to spend time with God. Uh, when, you, when you think about the only, really the only thing that Jesus' disciples ever asked them, asked him to teach them is, Lord, teach us to pray. 
Uh, they didn't say, Lord, teach us how to heal the lepers. Lord, teach us how to multiply the food. Uh, Lord, uh, teach us how to cast out demons. Mm -hmm. uh, instead, their request to Jesus is, Lord, teach us to pray. I think that this, the disciples kind of early on probably figured out that Jesus' connection to the Father, uh, that Jesus' connection uh, was what empowered him, is where his strength came from, that, uh, uh, you know, Jesus in the human form, uh, God the Son came down from heaven, lowered himself, uh, really uh, took on uh, the, the, the brokenness of human flesh, mm -hmm. And I think he demonstrates to the disciples and demonstrates to us the importance of a prayer life. Yes. That if, uh, that if you want to be connected to God, if you want to walk on the water spiritually, then you, you need to be spending some time with God. You need to be talking to God. Absolutely. And you need to be listening to God because that's a part of prayer as well. Yeah. Well, you know, we joked one day at staff meeting in one of our uh, sessions, Wesley, about be careful what you pray for. You might just get it. And I know in, in my own situation... Uh, I, there were some things in my life that uh, Gail and I had been praying for, and when the answer came, uh, it, it, you know, it was it was one of those situations where we actually uh, saw God in action, uh, and and I can't tell you what a, a, an eye-opening experience that was. Uh, kind of like seeing God walk on the, walk on the water that day when when your prayers get answered. So uh, that's what God offers you. Now, maybe the good thing, Caleb, about this whole coronavirus experience is that we really have been invited to spend some time away, apart, uh, where we might plug into God better. And I, I, think that's, uh, I think that's good for us. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're, you can never go wrong by plugging into God more. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's important that, not we, that we not only seek uh, messages through our social media outlets right now, but that we ourselves are taking the initiative during this time we may be in our homes with our families to lead our families closer to God, to lead one another into a discipleship, that we continue this faith journey that we are on with Jesus walking beside us. And, you know, we're about to get into a Peter imitating or trying to imitate Jesus by walking on this water. Maybe we also need to look at imitating Jesus in his solitude, in that prayer life. In fact, there's a, a popular movie called War Room about having just a room to oneself and just absoluting, absolutely uh, letting God have it in our prayers. I mean, if we're angry at God, yell at him. If we're sad, cry with them. But the fact is, God is there with us. So getting deeper into the scripture and getting deeper into uh, this story in Matthew, I think we see again that uh, Jesus is taming the waters by walking on them this time. And Matthew's, uh, and in Matthew's writing, you know, this kind of reiterates again. You know, during this time of uh, emperor, uh, I'm going to call him Domitian. Uh, That's close enough. Domitian. <laughs> what, what was his title? You know, what was his title? And he, I believe he called himself, quote, ruler of land, seas, and nations. But once again, we see Jesus' power, God's power over sea, nature, Domitian. Uh, and it's very similar to the Exodus deliverance from a tyrant, and it, it, and it shows a similar power that God demonstrates. Um, you almost have the, the, here's the counterfeit power of Rome, <laughs> mm -hmm. an emperor who declares that he has authority over land and sea, and yet in all reality, he really doesn't. <laughs> no. And, that, and yet you have Jesus here who really makes no claim Yet he just stands up and calls, calms the sea and walks on the water. Uh, does he just let it speak for, his, for itself? It really does. That, I, I, think, I think in this situation uh, that you really don't have to send out an edict and have uh, you know the town crier announcing your title mm -hmm. uh, when, you, when you literally just stand up and do it. I mean, uh, you know, that, that everybody kind of focuses on the man that's taking control of the weather. Absolutely. I guess you could say he walked the walk. <laughs> I'm terrible. I'm terrible. Please laugh at that. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
But right after this, we see Peter making this attempt, trying to imitate Jesus, trying to choose faith over fear, calls out using words from watery after that fear overtakes him uh, from Psalm 69, 1 through 3. But what is the thing that reaches down that uh, Peter grabs a hold of when he takes his eyes off Jesus? And that is so important that right now that we are keeping our eyes on Jesus, just like Peter was trying so hard to keep his eyes on Jesus, making that attempt, trying to imitate being Christ-like, but eventually he took his eyes off Jesus and he falls. But what saves Peter here? And I believe it is that hand that Jesus reached down to Peter in the water, who uh, in scripture, I think it's important to note here that uh, Peter, he said, Peter, ye of little faith, not Peter of no faith. That even though, um, even though Peter fell, he still had faith. And I think that's important because I feel like sometimes we feel like our faith is uh, not enough. It may be, quote unquote, little. Um, I mean, what, what do you guys think of that? Having, having little faith versus this, you know, idea of just having no faith. Well, you know, I think in, I think in this story, sometimes we're terribly hard on Peter. Uh, but in all reality, he is doing a worthwhile thing. He's trying to imitate Jesus. Yes. Which reminds me of the First Corinthians chapter 11 uh, passage where Paul tells the church in Corinth, imitate me as I am imitating Christ. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, so I think Peter, like all of us who have faith in Jesus, our faith is a work in progress. Absolutely. Uh, Peter has uh, made a pretty good start. He's following Jesus. And even in the midst of this miraculous uh, walking on the water by Jesus, Peter says, you know what? I believe in him. I can do this. Absolutely. Uh, he struggles. Uh, but but, but, but mm -hmm. also Jesus is there to rescue him. You know, this is not the first or the last time that Peter's faith, faith falters. Uh, but even even after the denial of Jesus uh, at the at the crucifixion, Peter still has faith, and in mm -hmm. fact, that faith is reconciled again on the on the Sea of Galilee, mm -hmm. uh, which is a great contrast to the two stories we've looked at, yeah. uh, where Peter keeps having these experiences with Jesus on the sea. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I think, like all of us, you know, uh, you know, faith faith has to grow, faith has to expand. Uh, and there are things that will suck the life out from under us. There are things that will sort of crash into our lives uh, where our faith is shaken or shattered. Uh, but the beautiful thing about this passage is that Jesus has all the power that is necessary to put Peter's faith back together again and to start him back on that road of following Jesus. Absolutely. I think the initial reaction of Peter was that he was reacting in faith mm -hmm. um, to go toward Jesus, to imitate Jesus. And I feel like that's what we are all called to do, especially in hard times like this when the seas are choppy, is to react in faith in Christ. It only we only sink it when we take our eyes off Jesus. <laughs> I think that is a I think that's important to understand and um what do you, what? Well, I, I, I just uh, want to emphasize that it's, uh, it's just that simple, guys. Uh, turn and extend your hand. God is standing there and ready to take your hand and to help you uh, on your faith journey. Uh, everyone is not in the same place. Uh, I, I have been on a, a, a journey that uh, myself that uh, has lasted about three years. Uh, that's still a work in progress, and it and it simply involved turning to Jesus and and asking for help, and and that's where we start. Uh, that's where Peter started, and that's where you can start it. And I think the final thing I have to say about this passage um, is that the disciples have now recognized Jesus as God's agent, the Son of God, His works. They agree with God's perspective. They understand who this person is, the power over the waters, the power over humanity. There is nothing of Rome or 
anyone really that can overpower who this person is and what he represents to us here on earth. This is the Son of God. He holds God's authority. So I guess the last question I kind of want us to dive in on here, just really go for it, is when we reach out, are we reaching for Jesus' hand or are we allowing fear to dictate our faith? Um, and for me, it's really hard not to be scared right now. It's really hard walking into a Walmart or Piggly Wiggly or Food Giant or Kroger and not want to be six feet away from people. But it's also hard for me to see an older man looking for toilet paper or Germex and my heart not break for him and say, what can I do to help? And I think we are called to help those that need that help right now. And when we do that, we are being Jesus's hands for those people. And that is why it is so important that we're still plugged into church, that we are still understanding that we have a calling that we are not allowing our fear and the self-preservation to take over and that we are still allowing God's spirit to flow through us, that we may be the hands and feet of Christ in the world. What do you guys think? Well, you know, the, um, of course, I would encourage everybody to social distance as much as possible uh, to, uh, to not... Uh, uh, Try to, you know, be, be really careful that we might spread something to someone else. I think all that's very important. But I think that fear is always trying to creep in. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a global pandemic going on for that to happen. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, you know, one of the things uh, that Scripture tells us is that God has not given us a spirit of fear. No. Uh, and, and But that's, that spirit of fear is always trying to creep into my life. Uh, and what I see in this story is sort of this reminder that when that fear begins to creep in, that my response is to reach for Jesus. Yes. Uh, and that he has the power then to pull me out of that situation. Yes. Uh, you know, whether that's uh, uh, illness, whether that's uh, uh, trouble in your family, trouble with your spouse, uh, financial trouble, that 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 Jesus, if we truly give ourselves over him and, and allow the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us and direct us, that just as Jesus pulled Peter out of the, the turbulent waters of the Sea of Galilee, he can reach that and pull us out too. Absolutely. And um, I hear that in that passage for me because I, I struggle with fear uh, lots of times when there's not a pandemic. Yes, uh, absolutely. Well, you've heard of people talk about keeping their head above water, and, and that's a very real analogy. I understand drowning is, is quite a, a hor horrible way to go. Uh, but uh, so, yeah, I, I just depend on the Lord to, to help me stay afloat every day. Absolutely. Well, that is what I have for us today. That's kind of me leading uh, the Bible study this week. But once again, we have hand sanitizer here at the church. And if you are in need of that, feel free to contact us and we'll be happy to bring it to you. Drop it on your doorstep. Or if you're in need of anything during this time, do not be afraid to reach out to First United Methodist Church, Amory, Mississippi. And we will do our best to assist if you need groceries, medicine. Uh, we are here for you and we are going to continue to let God's spirit move with us. All right. Amen, everyone. Amen. Amen. <laughs>